Hello, everybody. Welcome to Aquarius Rising Africa 2. I can see I'm not getting my gadgets and my things here sorted, sorted today. Welcome, everybody. And um, before I bring our beautiful Bryce on, shout out to our sponsor today, who's the awesome Spooky 2 and um, the, the creators of their home rife machines. And I want to say to you that Spooky 2 is having their 11th anniversary. So they're giving uh, off amazing, and I want to just actually find it here. Sorry, there's just a lot here. They are having amazing deals at the moment on their products. Um, so I'm going to create also in the link, which is not in there now, but I'm going to put it in after the show. You're going to see that they've got amazing uh, deals on their, their general Rife machines, the Hiwi, the Myromate. And your product code is Chantel0401. And then you're going to get an extra $15 off your um, your, your uh, kit because you can, they, they, they working with anniversary kits, they call them. So it's a minimum of $500. But then, of course, you, and that would be on the Spooky 2, the Scale, or the Myromate, and the Hiwi. So if you guys are interested in checking that out, you're still going to get your, um, usual 5% off, but then plus uh, more when you're looking at the anniversary special. So they are 11 years old today, which is absolutely quite amazing. So again, for those of you who've been using these machines at all, or even checking them out, you'll know exactly what I'm speaking about. But before we go any further, let's do the promo. Hi, John, Echo, and the Spooky 2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I. I'm actually sitting in the Scala field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our uh, vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements we hardly take them we used to take them to support and supplement our well-being but i've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth the skin's gotten uh, beautiful the dh experimental frequencies i've been experimenting with a lot of them we have such good strength in our body we don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever. But this time, I've started using the Immune Super Booster. And oh my God, it is magic. Uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well. So we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it. And uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound. And I have always been... So I pray daily. I meditate daily. And I've been sitting in the scale I feel and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a net nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well in the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes. And the, the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also, I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement, right? And if people were to not believe this, all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is. I can't like recommend this more to anybody like. So yes, much love and gratitude. Thank you for listening. And uh, I could share so much more, but I'd like to wrap this up now. Thank you. Well, there you have it. And I will be putting uh, the links for, as I said, the Spooky 2 birthday special in the description after the show. So catch it there afterwards. And as I said, product code, 
code Chantal0401. Cool. And yeah, we bring on our beautiful bride. Hello, honey. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. We've got the uh, it's, it's Spooky 2's 11-year anniversary, and we're at the a big eclipse today. That's pretty cool. That's pretty auspicious. It's it's very auspicious. It's a very cool time. And I mean, I know you guys um, are pretty much in the path of the eclipse there in America. So I know all sorts. Of, and that there's all sorts of people having all sorts of fears around the eclipse. But I just want to say, guys, ground yourself, anchor yourself. It's all about love. No one can do anything to you um, without your permission. Let's never forget that. So it's a beautiful time of change. It's a beautiful time of transformation. It's a time to empower yourself. Um, it's just a, it's a beautiful time to be alive. And let's never yeah. let, let us never let anyone ever take that uh, power away from us. You are your own authority. Yeah. You are your own uh, strength. And no need to be nervous, honey, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, don't be nervous, Jessica. Yeah. And I see Charmaine's getting ready for it. And I'm excited. You know, it's not, it's very, very rare that we get to experience, you know, this is seven years. We had it, the same thing happened seven years ago. I experienced it. We're going to be here in, in Georgia. We're going to be at 88% totality. So between 3.04 p.m. and 3, uh, and sorry, 3.04 p.m. and 4.22 p.m., in um in Atlanta, Georgia, we're going to be at eighty eight percent totality. So that means that it's going it's it's pretty wild to experience. I remember seven years ago when we experienced it, and it gets really dark. But just think about like how. So Jessica, I know Ohio is like right there, close to to um to total totality. Just think about how cool it is that you are positioned in this life in an area that you get to witness this. You know, even though it's the eclipse for the whole world, Shanti didn't get to, you didn't get to totality today, did you, Shanti? Have any, you didn't get to see we No, we're still alive. Yeah. And I know my alive. friend Tamara. Australia is alive as yes. well. And my friend Tamara just messaged me this morning over, she was going to bed and she was like, I feel great. Have a blessed day. So don't, don't worry, Jessica. You know, there's so many things in this life that are out of our control you can't control the moon. You can't control the sun. Thank I know we have people in the world who are trying to control the moon and sun, but you know, I wouldn't want that job, you know, just, but so, you know, I always think with the, this thing like case sera, sera, right? Whatever will be, will be. You're good though. You're totally good. The only thing we can, we can control are ourselves, you know? And so enjoy this masterpiece of wondery that you get to actually see God's yeah. work. You know, we, we, we forget that the darkness can't create anything, only the light can create. And so this is a, mag a magnificent experience that you get on planet Earth in this life. So when it when you get to that place, wherever you are in the United States, where, where it's different times for different areas, you can look it up online. When you get, go outside. I know businesses and towns that are in the totality zone are closing down today. Go outside with your kids. I can't wait. I'm, after I hop off with you guys, I'm going to go try to get all my stuff done so that at 3 o'clock we can head outside with our dog and just go sit in the park and just experience this. You know, that's part of – what did Alan Watts say when someone asked Alan Watts, what's the point of life? And he said the point of life is to be alive. Just go be alive and enjoy. Don't worry, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh. You are, you are where you are supposed to be in this moment. You are, to, you are absolutely okay. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lisa D, I'm going to go outside and stay straight. Exactly. Exactly, Lisa D. I'm yeah. so with you. Yeah. And it's also really overcast, yes. Yeah. So even if anything was happening yet today, I wouldn't be seeing much. We, I mean, Very seven overcast. years ago, we went and got the glasses to watch it, but I'm not, we didn't get any glasses for this time. We're just going to go outside and we live right down from the park. We're just going to go and experience it and just, um, and just really, really just um, be here, be, be here now, be here in the moment with this. Because it literally like what's happening in the United States right now only happens every like 300 years or something or 150. Yeah. So we are so lucky to be living at the time where we get to experience this. And think about generations before us who experience this. If the timeline they give us is correct, they probably panicked because they thought, like, thought the apocalypse was coming. Now we know what it is, and it's just a natural phenomenon. And that's all. And God created the stars and the heavens and and all of this. So just enjoy it, you guys. Enjoy it. I'm going to film it. I'm going to send it to Shanti and send it to all my friends 
overseas so they can share in this magic too total magic yeah yeah you know really looking forward to that so enjoy it guys have fun while you're doing it as well so yeah don't let the people scare you about it Je uh, can, jessica before we get into it if you're still on what time is it going to be at totality for you susan's saying the peak will be at 11 11 30 a.m on the left on the left coast <laughs> the, the west coast the left coast <laughs> um i know different places have different times we're at 304 so jessica if you put it in Put in the comment section what time you're supposed to be at totality in Ohio. I'll send out a special prayer that you stay safe because I know I know you're going to be safe. So, so many fear stories are going around. We can't stop any nefarious plans, but only ask. Yeah, exactly. What case sera sera, right? Your whatever is going to be is going to be, and that's and that's you're 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 always where you're supposed to be, even if it doesn't feel like it. You're always where it's supposed supposed to be. So. Don't worry, don't panic, Justin. How cool is it that you get to experience a time where in the middle of the day, it goes completely dark outside for a, an hour you know, or so, and everybody's gonna be outside. I know in Atlanta, everybody's gonna be outside watching. Like, How cool is it that you get to have that community experience too with your neighbors, you know, with your, you know, we get to watch this, yeah? So don't freak out. So MA is 3.29, so May, that Maine is 3.29 p.m. Yes, you're a little bit behind me, Lisa D. We're at 3.04. So, oh yeah, Charmaine, you're at your same as me, 3.04 p.m. Yeah. I was singing the song yesterday, Bryce Doris Day. Yeah, Karen, yeah, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. You've done your work. Nice. Jennifer Brown is saying 1.39 p.m. in Texas. Yeah, so look it up, guys. It'll have a, it'll have a chart for you. It'll say where wherever you're located, the time it starts and the time it ends. So you'll know when to step outside. And if you're at work, I'm sure to God your boss is going to let you step outside to watch this. So yeah, I'm 45 acres of leave me the f alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll enjoy that. Well, I'm with you. On that let us know how the animals respond. Let us know how the animals respond to to the eclipse. If you're out in nature, I'm curious. I don't think Robbie's going to care, to be honest with you. He was with me seven years ago, and I was at my mom's house, and she has a little King Charles Spaniel. And Maggie was sitting on my lap. She's a small dog, and all I remember with Robbie is he got so pissed that Maggie was sitting on my lap. He took a snout and like bopped her off my lap and sat his piney in my lap, even though he was way too big to be sitting in my lap. So he didn't really care as long as he had my attention. But I am curious to see like how the animals respond to the eclipse. Mm -hmm. Do you hear more birds? Absolutely. Do you see more squirrels? Like what's there? Are they just cool, calm, and collective? If animals are cool, calm, and collective. Everyone good. else is cool too, yeah. yeah. So if you live in Thailand and you see the elephants start running up here, follow them. <laughs> Get on the back of them. Jump on the back. <laughs> Hang on to exactly. one of the legs. <laughs> like, hey, buddy, where you go? Give me a ride. I trust an animal any day over a meteorologist on the news. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? um, exactly. Right. Je uh, Jessica, you're saying 2 p.m. here. Yeah, you're going to be fine, girl. Enjoy it. God, you're like right. You're right there. And that's just so cool. Enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Take pictures. Film it. Enjoy being being in that moment. For sure. I agree. I agree. Now, speaking about dodginess. <laughs> Yo! are, we, are we ready? Are we ready for the next level of dodginess Let's that's talk happening? About it, because I, I keep I keep under Romanov and these conspiracies. Yeah, wow. We I think we have some idea that like we're the first group of people, the first timeline to think that all these conspiracies are just now like we're the ones that have discovered them or we've created them y'all know this shit's been going on forever <laughs> and especially with the romanovs and i thought I, I said again we're gonna we're building up to anastasia romanov the big conspiracy right uh and i said we gotta cover some of these past romanovs and i literally thought we were gonna do like the first of the romanovs Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and then go to the last of the Romanovs. But then I saw Paul, the Knights of Malta, and I was like, this is juicy. we got to talk about this. And then I found <laughs> Alexander's conspiracy, Paul's son. I was like, WTF. I was like, this is just, yeah. this is so hot. This is hot gossip, you guys. This is hot gossip. And um, 
So I, I mean, I mean, that's what you, you got to, if you guys are, if we have any young ones watching right now and you're in school, just know your history teachers, they have all the tea. They have all the tea. They have all the gossip. They're the ones that are the interesting ones in your school, right? Like your chemistry teacher doesn't have gossip like your history teacher has. Okay. So, so let's talk about it, you guys, because again, we, and this is important. Why? Well, and it's fun because this is, these uh, were people and this really happened. So it's interesting. But also, as I said, the whole point academically for us to study history is why. So we don't repeat the same mistakes, but we're dumbasses. And we always repeat the same mistakes. So the way I'm perceiving this is, again, it kind of, we were kind of chatting about this offline, Shanti, and we've talked about this a lot. Like all this information that we're learning is so valuable about what's really going on in the world. But it's valuable for us to know so that we know the truth of our existence. But what's really- And also what's been going on since forever. Since forever. You know? And I mean, yes, is it, is it 100% true? Probably not. There, but I'd say it's probably eighty percent on the on the button, right? Yeah. So, but I, I really think it's so important for us to realize, you know, the more we go into these past uh, uh, dodgy um, ancestors of ours, call it that, it really is um, uh, um, making us understand that things have never really changed with these guys. And no. I say these guys because. They've been the conquerors and the rulers of the world. Um, their whole objective has always been money, power, and sex, right? Yep. Fame, well, power power for me, power and fame go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. And sex, I mean, if you're looking at Catherine's furniture and um, the one with the winky in the, in the pickle jar, <laughs> that one. We love I our mean, Russians. We love our Russians. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at these things. There's always been money, power, sex. And I mean, that is humanity's weakness. And guys, and for those of you, I want to say it again. If you have not watched my interview with uh, John Perkins, the, the, uh, the, the, the author of uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you please go and watch it. He is phenomenal. He's a phenomenal, and I mean, he wrote that basically. It was a, it's, it was on the New York a New York Times bestseller list for seventy weeks, right? Oh, wow. Seventy weeks, and he spoke about um, and also because when you know he got into this whole stuff in the early seventies, and he was the first trailblazer to blow the whistle on on this whole um, the, the 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 U.S. government literally corrupting, especially the third world countries to usurp their, their resources. So, and he, and, and they were, they did a, 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 an analysis on him and they realized there was three things he liked because he came from a family of teachers, right? And so there wasn't much money there, but three things he liked. He liked money, he liked power, and he liked women. And those were his weaknesses, and that's how he was exploited. And the deception that comes along with these exploitations is on another level because they will make people believe, and still people in who are working for the Illuminati companies now are still think are still believing they're doing the right thing. You know, and it's easy for us to look out and say, say to someone else, well, they the corruptors. How many of us are working for banks? Hello? How many yeah. of us are working for for um, the current uh, uh, schooling system, right? Yeah. How many of us are working for these big corporate companies that are owned? How many of us work for media, right? Working for them means you're participating you're in this corruption. And if you have a bank account, you participating. Hello? Right there, I have a bank account. I can't, right now, we can't operate without a bank account. Exactly. So what I'm saying is, sorry, I, I, I don't mean to digress. But what I'm saying is, is that nothing has really changed. So if we can identify our own weaknesses, right, and understand that what happened then is happening now. And nothing has ever changed in human nature. And this time that we're living in is the opportunity for us to expand our consciousness and to resurrect our consciousness. I know in, in Caleb's show last night, I was having a discussion about resurrection. And they were saying, yes, but it's a physical. I'm going, no. No, you're not gonna that's so awesome. 
physically, right? Unless you resurrected your spirit. Yeah. You have yeah. to resurrect your consciousness in order for us to resurrect our physical being. I mean, and that's a whole topic for another yeah. day because yeah. it's not about the way, you know, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's a whole different topic. But it's a physical, it's a, it's a conscious resurrection and it's about choosing trust, choosing to trust your spirit, not someone else's spirit telling you what to do, exactly. your own spirit. And when you do that, you elevate your consciousness to a whole nother level. We have the opportunity of doing that now. And for the first time ever, we have the opportunity to do that. So and that's, that's what it is. too, Because like when we're looking at Alexander, he faked his death and there were conspiracy theories about him faking his death. That's what we're going to get to. How many people hear we hear the same story today? So what's the difference? What's the difference between this time and that time? The difference is, is we have a choice. We can either just get right. all into the, the story or we can say, huh, they're doing the same thing again. How are we going to get out of this? We can only get out of this by actually working on ourselves. And, you know, and so, and that's the thing too, that's what we are talking about off camera. It's, and that's why it's so important because if we don't actually take a step back and, and start working on ourselves, this story, this timeline where we, we're in now is just going to become history for a later generation. And the bad guys and the fairy ones will still keep just playing the same old script out. We are not, we are not the first people to realize that there are conspiracies out there. We are, except for back then, the, the peasants, us peasants, didn't have as much power as we do now, you know? And so it's our choice. We can, and that's what, you know, a lot of times we get into this, you know, us versus them mentality, like they're the bad guys, they're the good guys. Well, first of all, that's painting things black and white, which is a sign of a mental disorder. You know, as we look at these, each, each of these individuals within these nefarious families, and thank you, God, that there were people born into these nefarious families who are good people. You know, God bless the trauma they went through who left when they could. A lot of them come on this channel with Shanti to inform us. So we have to look at even, even within the nefarious people, we see people who are stuck themselves. And so we have to have that compassion, have that understanding that things are not as black and white as we think they are. And the only thing that's going to get us out of this, this, just this loop of just repetitive history is if we actually start owning ourselves and owning right. our own soul and it, it cracks me up that people just confuse the fact that their physical they confuse their soul with their physical body the two are different things the physical body was always meant to be a temporary experience the soul is what's eternal right exactly. and so if you trust that you have a soul that's eternal you can really enjoy this life knowing that it's temporary you're not going to be terrified of losing your body because you'll know that the soul is eternal and the soul manifested this body, created this body to experience. The soul is going to create many more bodies, many more experiences because that's the power of the soul, you know? And so, and so we, we, we look at this stuff. I, I, you know, I, I think it's juicy and, and interesting and, you know, I will so, sit here. Anyway. Hey, hey, I'm here for it. I'm I'm, here I for will it. talk about Catherine the Great's furniture for any of the, I mean, I will gossip with you guys about that furniture any day of the week. I'm so but, here for it. So fire away. Bring us the, can, bring us the tea. Spill we can that talk tea. about Putin's wiener any day of the week. <laughs> That's, and you know, we can laugh about it and gossip about it, but also understand like <laughs> shit's been done before y'all, you know, and so we can take the power back and, and change the course of our history here for our children and our children's children. So they have a more fair existence. So y'all, I, like I said, I thought after we did Catherine, we were going to go ahead and skip to the bulk of its revolution. But then I saw Paul the Nice of Malta and I was like, we got to talk about that. And then I saw his son. The, the every even historians, you guys, like I, it cracks me up because no one is as petty as an actual historian. Like historians <laughs> are so petty. Like I, and I'm here for it. Like I don't consider myself. I'm just a researcher. Like I'm just, I'm not a historian. But I love listening to historians debate. It is juicy because they get stuck <laughs> on their own theories and they have all this proof and they like try to out out gossip each other with their facts. But even with <laughs> Alexander, I mean, it's fantastic, you guys. I love it. You want to be entertained. 
go on YouTube. <laughs> if you just need to like relax your mind for a second, go on YouTube and find historians, scholars debating certain <laughs> historical events. Uh, <laughs> it is, it is like, get your popcorn. Like it is juicy, you know? So with Alexander the first of Russia, Paul's son, Catherine, the great grandson, we still in 2024 have historians, half of the half historians think he faked his death and half of them don't. That's how big this can. I kind of think he did. We'll, we'll get to the my, my opinion is he did because I will get into why I think he did. I'll, the proof is overwhelming and it just goes to show you here we are. We're whispering about JFK Jr. We're whispering about Princess Diana. Michael Jackson, all these people we think might have faked their deaths, but you guys, this has been done so many times before. So, and I'm kind of here for it. Like there, the thing about Alex, I, I keep calling him Alex. I'm sure that's not how he, went. he probably went by Alexander, but I keep calling him Alex. Okay. Ali, what, what, what would they have called him? Alex, um, Alex, Alex. Yeah. Alex is the way that the, 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 the Russians pronounce it, Alex. Alex. Like he, so yeah, I dated a Russian guy. Not, I mean, years ago called Alex. So. Alex. <laughs> yeah. Alexi, actually, Alexi, Alexi was his name. Well, I mean, like, okay, y'all, like, we're gonna talk about some weird mama issues. We're gonna talk about someone not wanting to be a czar. Like, this is this is like this is tea. <laughs> this is tea, y'all. Like, if you want to talk about some family, like, why, why do we even, I'm like, I mean, I love my reality TV as well. Like, I love my housewives and all that kind of stuff because it's so scandalous. But, like, people literally should, like, remake these stories because this shit's juicy. Like, I, 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 no matter how many family dramas you think you have, at least your grandmother didn't have coffee tables with lingams on them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just call them penises. Penises. I'm just trying to be okay careful with the algorithms. Like at least you You're didn't allowed to understand. Like that thing would choke you, man. Oh my god, that's a huge, painful, painful. <laughs> at least there's not a theory that your grandmother was killed boinking a horse. All right. But, and not only at least you're not living with that theory, but your father started it. I think the table must have been modeled on that theory. On the horse. I mean, like, could you imagine the trauma if your grandmother had that, if that was going around the town, that your grandmother died because she was boinking a horse? Like, I don't care who you are. That's mortifying. I can't imagine it, but I'm here for it. I'm totally here for it. And I feel like we can laugh about it because these people are long dead, so it's it's no harm, no foul. But here's the thing about a, a little, our little Alex, our Alex Pooey, Pooey here. So he was the son of Paul, right? We talked about Paul last time in the Knights of Malta and Paul was like totally abused. We know he, ta Paul like had absolute PTSD. Like Paul was like a poster child for a post-traumatic stress disorder because of his childhood. Well, what Paul didn't have, Alex had. So where Paul was neglected by his mother and remember the story about how he would fall out of his crib at night and no one would come get him. And so they just find him laying on the floor in the morning. Well, Alex was like overly coddled. So Catherine came and got and got Jay. We're, we're just listen, Jay. We're having, but, fun. We're Jay, having you know, fun. Jay, you know who can't laugh are demons. So maybe you should uh, maybe you should check yourself there because the people who can't laugh, the empties that don't know how to laugh are demons. We can laugh at this stuff. It's what takes the power away from the darkness because the darkness cannot laugh. All right. So Alex was totally coddled by his grandmother. When Paul was born, if you guys remember way back to Catherine the Great, when Paul was born, Catherine's son, Empress Elizabeth, Paul's great, great aunt, came and, came and got Paul from Catherine. Well, the same thing happened with Paul and his second wife when Alex, the first of like 10 children were born. Catherine went and got Alex from Paul and raised, she put all of her motherly love and coddling into Alex. She even was the one who named Alex and she named him after Alexander the Great, which to me speaks volumes. We've talked about that little psycho Alexander the Great on this channel, the cannibal, the cannibal Alexander the Great, who also had those parties that the celebrities have, who, um, you know, was having his way with children like that the guy who started secret societies and started this dionysian cult where they are where they eat humans that guy that guy um well she named yeah. her grandson after him so and i i totally think that she knew i mean alexander the great was the start of all of this deep darkness crap that we we, we there's a, we have a video on aquarius rising africa about that if you guys missed that so now 
as Alex was growing up, he, he was born on December 26th, 1777. Again, he was the first surviving son of Paul and his second wife, grandson of Catherine the Great. As Alex was growing up, he had a very de different disposition than his father, Paul, mainly because I believe Alex was not as traumatized. I think he became traumatized, but in different ways. Whereas Paul was super neglected and therefore created imaginary friends and had this delusional world, Alex was like the heli like Catherine was like the helicopter mom without with Alex, right? So to like smothered him with love, right? Now it is stated that Alex was obviously very was showed high high signs of intellect from a very very early age. Now we also have this predisposition with Alex for mental illness. We see this with his father Paul. We see this with his grandfather Peter the Third, who was Catherine's husband. We see this propensity for what a lot of historians say that looking back, they believe it was schizophrenia, which is what, what they, they had. And, you know, you know, we know schizophrenia might be something a little bit different than what they tell us it is, but just for the story, just know that that's kind of foreshadowing. But as a kid, he did not show any signs of having any paranoia, any delusions. He was very, very smart. In fact, um, he started to develop this just strong political skill at a very young age. And they said that he could get people to tell him everything while he revealed nothing. He was also able to hide and control his emotions. Like his father couldn't do that. Like Paul could not hide and control his emotions. And I know that when you have an, an anxiety disorder, when you're traumatized, when your nervous system is dysregulated, it's really hard to hide your emotions. Like you see sh shoulders start to shake. I've had that happen to me. So I think for Paul, with his trauma, he literally, his nervous system was so dysregulated that he could not hide how he was feeling. But Alex had more coddling and more support. So he was able to like master this skill that was would appear to serve him well as the future czar. But isn't um, that also a very, I mean, to really hide your emotions, that's like a bit of a psychopath. Psychopaths yeah. do that very well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Psychopathic tendencies. They really, they can emulate emotions and they can be like ice. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So he, mm. and he could, he, so, yeah. So it was, a, it was kind of like the strategy, right? Well, at 15, uh, he met his future wife, Louise of Barden, who became known as Elizabeth when she converted to Russian Orthodoxy. It was arranged by, arranged by grandma. Meemaw Catherine was arranged in this marriage. Um, he married her on the 9th of October, 1793. He was 16. Uh, Elizabeth now, who was Louise, was only 14 when they got married. Now, for all intent and purposes, I actually like, I'm totally here for their relationship, Elizabeth and Alex. I actually very much respect their relationship. They were absolutely not in love. Now, I think I sent you a picture of both of them. Elizabeth, her, now to me, let's be honest, you guys, royalty is not, the, they're not the cutest. Like people who are born in royal families are just, they don't, they don't Yes, they, they're not the cutest people in the world. But Alex, out of the line of his, I mean, his father was horrific looking. Alex was probably the better looking of, of many of the royals up to this point. Not not something I think we'd be attracted to now. But like, he, has, he, has, he got a mohawk going, you know, he's a hipster. He's, um, you know, he's very blonde, blue eyed. Um, but out of, you know, compared to his father, compared to his grandfather, compared to his whatever great grandfather, the psychopath, Peter the Great, he was pretty good looking. You know, people in the town thought he was like the bee's knees, right? Well, Elizabeth, his wife, was also known for her beauty. And also Elizabeth seemed to have like a really cool personality. She was very kind, very gentle, very compassionate person. And even though they were married for political purposes, the two, even though they were like, the good looking people of court, they they were obviously not in love with each other. And they both knew that. They both knew it was a political arranged, arranged um marriage, if you if you if you be. But but they were still, they took on different lovers, you know, openly, but they were still like each other's biggest support system. And we see this really big time at the end of end of his reign. Now, Paul, if you remember, now hurt people hurt other people. So when when Alex married Elizabeth, Paul was. Give me one minute. I'll be back now. Okay. Can we keep talking? 
Oh, okay, cool, guys. All right, all right. So um, Paul, if you guys know, hurt people hurt people, right? So Paul, the father, who was totally traumatized, when um, Alex married Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was so beautiful, and she came to the court, Paul made it a point to, like, bring tear Elizabeth down. Like, he totally, in my opinion, like, mentally abused her. He mentally just tore her down. And so she took a lot from Paul. Now, something I want to bring up, which I thought was super weird. I don't know what this was about because we just don't, I don't know if we, I mean, maybe we kind of do this with our tabloids today, but Elizabeth was so pretty that there were these clubs that were formed in the Russian court that men, men grow, this is a 14 year old girl, by the way, she's 14 years old. These grown ass men in this Russian court would, um, oh no, Jessica Shanti, I think she just, it looked like she had someone at her door. So, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Jessica. Jessica. She's see, here, she's back. So Jessica was panicked because you left. It's, yeah. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The reason I left is I have about 150 doves outside my door who are telling me I have not fed them yet. So I had to go and feed my doves. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries, Jessica. Don't worry. Take a deep breath, girl. It's all fine. It's all fine. If something <laughs> bad were happening to Shanti in the moment, I don't think she would just politely log, log off of the off of a live show. <laughs> Listen, someone would be an idiot to try to attack us when we were on a live show, right? Like that would be pretty idiotic. So we are live right now. So don't, don't, don't freak out. But anyway, I was just saying, Shanti, that something that was super weird to me. So Elizabeth, at 14 years old, moves to Russia. She's now the, the czar in waiting, czarina in waiting with, with Alex, her husband. And these grown-ass men in the court of Russia created these clubs based around Elizabeth's beauty. That would, I mean, I mean, it's obviously flattering when someone thinks you're gorgeous, but that would kind of weird me out. Yeah, that's what that's not appropriate. Listen, I know times were different back then. What's that saying about history? Um, history is like a different country. They do things differently there. There's a quote about that. But still, like I putting myself in Elizabeth's shoes, you're new to this country. You've now been married off to the son of the prince. You you and you got these men, you know, I don't know. I just, that just weirded me out. Now around this time too, Elizabeth, I just, just to make it clear, Elizabeth and Alex did have two children, but they didn't make it past infancy. So as we go forward, just know that they had two children, didn't make it past infancy. So they have no children to inherit after Alex, but Alex did have six illegitimate children with his mistresses, just to put that out there. All right. Now around this time, Alex, Elizabeth was like Alice, Alex's best friend. You know, they weren't in love with each other. They were totally cool with each other having other lovers. And Alex started to express, even though he was smart enough to be the czar, even though his grandmother had primed him to be the czar, he was starting to express a desire to not be the czar. Like we have multiple letters that Alex, unlike his father, Paul, Alex had a lot of friends his own age. We have multiple letters of Alex writing to his friends saying that he expressed his sorrow at being born a prince. He never felt like he wanted what was destined for him. And I quote here in one of the letters he wrote, I've sworn to myself to refuse it one way or another about being the czar. So that's just a little foreshadowing. He, from a very young age, did not want to be the czar. Even though he was smart enough, grounded enough, his father, on the other hand, couldn't wait until his hedonistic mother kicked the bucket so he could be the czar. But Alex did not want to do this. All right. So now let's go back to one thing I wanted to mention before we move into his czardom is you remember how I said he has this propensity genetically for, let's just say, for uh, just for shits and giggles, he has this propensity for a mental disorder, right? We, we could, dad's got a mental disorder, granddad's got a mental disorder. He has the propensity, regardless of what that is. And he showed no signs of it until, until an incident happened when he was in his like later teenage years. And what, what happened was, it was an accident. He was out with the army doing drills and a cannon was fired really close to his left ear. And it caused him to go deaf in his left ear. And after that happened, 
Alex got very paranoid. All of a sudden, we started to see paranoia in Alex. He thought everyone was laughing at him. There's a story where he would go, um, you know, walk down the hall and some of the military men or employees of the court would be like giggling or laughing with each, each other. And he would be certain they were laughing at him when they weren't, you know, and I, I have hearing problems too. I will, man, I do. I have a hard time hearing as well, but I've never been paranoid. Like I've never thought someone was so, you know, I, I don't know if that's just um, a perfect storm where he's already the prince of the prince and doesn't want to be like, doesn't want to be the czar one day. He's already feeling the stress of, of that. Um, he, now he's, you know, his grandmother is trying to sign this into petition where it skips Paul and goes to Alex, but Paul's upset about it. There's just a lot going on that I think, you know, if he, if it is in him to have schizophrenia, then it could have been something as simple as going deaf in one year to start that paranoia, if that makes sense. So just so you guys know that now. If you remember, Paul, his father, was assassinated on March 11th, 1881. We talked about that last week. Now, this is another thing. If you guys remember, um, this is, uh, oh, hold on a second. I don't know if your flag's leaving and it's hard to. Um, so, Bloom, that's a question for another day. Uh, I, I have an answer to that. We, we, That's a question for another day. Um, we're kind of talking about Alex today. Um, but... Um, but uh, so if you guys remember, um, Alex knew that they, that the, that the, so we've got this guy, I'm trying to put myself in Alex's shoes. We got this guy. He doesn't want to be the czar. He's very smart. He is deaf in one ear. He's growing paranoid. He knows that the country, once Catherine dies and his father becomes the czar, we've got the Knights of Malta now moving into Russia. The country of Russia is falling apart. So he doesn't want to be the czar, but he knows that someone's got to step in because if his dad keeps ruling, the country is absolutely going to fall apart. Right? So, um, so the, 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 um, there's a word for it, and I was skipping my, leaving my mind in a uh, Russian. I can't remember what they're called. We'll just call them the aristocrats. They have a specific word for them, but my mind is skipping my mind. Um, the aristocrats come to Alex and say, "We got to get your dad off the throne. The country's going to fall apart. And if we get your dad off the throne, you're the one that you have to take the throne. Like that's the law in in Russia. That's the law. We saw this with the issues with Peter the Great and Ivan. Like what happened with that? The law is the first son gets the throne, and so. Alex agrees and tells the aristocrats, do not hurt my father. Get him to abdicate. Don't touch a hair on his head. But we know that's not what happened. He was assassinated. So Alex is also, when he becomes the czar, he's also carrying that on his back, which we're going to see that later in his czardom. He's feeling the guilt of the fact that his father was killed. He's feeling responsible, even though he's not responsible because he wasn't there that night and he he pleaded with them not to not to touch a hair on his father, just get him to abdicate. He's starting to feel guilty and responsible for the fact that his dad was murdered. But if we go back to March 11th, 1801, when his father was murdered and Alex becomes czar, the people in Russia are told that uh, Paul was killed by a stroke. And they start to celebrate because, again, the country's falling apart. So Alex steps in and says, it's okay, it's okay. I'm going to rule Russia in the same spirit that my grandmother ruled Russia because Russia, Russia was prosperous under Catherine the Great. So when he becomes czar, he revokes a lot of his father's decrees. He restores the rights and the privileges to the nobles because, you know, his father took away the rights and privileges of the nobles, which I can understand actually why he would restore the rights and privileges from an economic perspective um, if I just step back for a moment and I take all the conspiracy out of it, we need rich people. Like rich people give us jobs. Like I've never gotten a job from a poor person, right? And so he's restoring. So in my mind, when I read that, I thought, okay, he's restoring the economy back to Russia by giving the rights back to the nobles. Um, he he wanted to the reform reform the empire in the name of enlightenment. He put together a group of young, educated men to advise him. So in this aspect, he's moving away from the nobles as his advisory board, right? The nobles were always the advisory board. Now he's restored their rights. So in my mind, they can supply more economy to the country, but he's removing them from the politics and he's bringing in young men that he feels will be good advisors to him, but they were all educated in Europe. 
And like his great, great grandfather, Peter, he wanted more of an, a Western approach to his reign. Okay, so he now is moving away from single czardom with just a few people whispering in his ear to actually having having like a parliament, right? Or like a cabinet of people talking issues and hearing different perspectives and making decisions with a group of people. So in that way, I think that's a pretty positive thing. So through this group, Russia was reformed. Universities, because remember, Catherine had opened up universities to noble women. But now, through her grandson, Alex, universities became available to everyone. Now, everyone was capable of going to university. They also He also relaxed censorship laws. He relaxed a lot of the censorship laws. So in the first part of his reign, he was open to hearing criticism from the people. All right, this is going to change. I'm telling you guys, this, this is going to change towards the end. He created new surf laws that a serfs could now buy their freedom, I laugh at this, if their owners allowed it. So we still got slaves, we still got serfs, but if you can afford your freedom and your owners allow for you to buy, buy your freedom, will allow you to be a free person. So this created a new class called the freed plowmen. The freed plowmen, which to me, if you have freed plowmen, it does seem like you're building an, an, a, 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 new, a new class of, of farmers you know, you need farmers. So, so this is, in a lot of ways, is probably bringing more stabilization to, to Russia. And this is just the beginning of his reign. Now, we have a big problem, though, that's looming, looming in Europe for a man who doesn't want to be the czar. He doesn't want to be the czariest of czars. He doesn't want to be the king of kings. He's doing it because he feels like he's obligated to. But we have this big problem in Europe. And I don't know if anybody can guess what it is. I'll just go ahead and say it. This problem is Napoleon Bonaparte. This is Napoleon. In my opinion, speaking of, of, of Tallawackies and wieners, I think Napoleon, if he really existed, I know there's a theory that he didn't exist, but let's say he did, that he must have had the tiniest itty bitty wiener that ever existed because this man went all over Europe, lifting his leg and peeing on everything. <laughs> and I am so, I, I, I actually have empathy for Alex in this in this situation because you got this man now remember the knights of malta in 1798 were moved to russia because napoleon took over malta so this has been kind of like a gnat just buzzing around around alex and the russian empire for a while all right and and for the americans and the, for the americans in the group we have a we have a contentious relation with relationship with napoleon the louisiana purchase was made between the United States and Napoleon, where America purchased Louisiana, which wasn't just the state, it was the whole Western coast, right? So so there's, there, Napoleon plays a part in American history too. All right, now, Alexander was not a military man. I'm not a military girl. If you guys want to, we're gonna talk a little bit about Napoleon and Alexander. If you want more information on the military history, that's not my wheelhouse. It's Whenever I study military history, it's like the wah, 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 just goes, I just, it's just, that's not my thing. I want to know about wiener furniture. That's what I want. I want to know about pickled wieners. Like, I don't want to know about, <laughs> I want to know who had schizophrenia. Like, I don't, you know, so, so there are a lot of great military channels out there. If you are more interested in the military history with Alex and Napoleon, um, but we're just going to go over just a few things, right? So Alex did try to go with the military to fight Napoleon, but apparently he just wasn't very athletic, bless his heart, he'd been too coddled. So he did hand over the decision-making to the generals, good for him. He knew he knew, he knew, knew where his strengths were and he went back to just politicking. But the stress of, of Napoleon was there the whole time. So I don't know why, I, guess, I think I do know why, but royalty is just extra. Like royalty can't just do things like normal people. Every time we see treaties signed in history, it, it's a big fanfare. You know, there's a story of when Henry VIII in England was signing over Mar Mary, his daughter, to the Dauphin of France, that she was like five, that marriage didn't work out. They came to France and they built this like silk city of tents. Like it was this big fanfare just for them to agree for a marriage. So royalty never does things. I mean, they are extra. They don't just do things normal like we do. So in 1807, Napoleon and Alex meet to discuss peace. Did they meet in some random room in a neutral country? No, of course not. They built 
a plant, like a, a raft, this elaborate raft that's probably bigger than my, my apartment with ornate gold. They stuck the raft in the middle of a river. Napoleon's troops were on one side, Russia's troops were on the other side, and Napoleon and Alex had a two-hour meeting. They literally built a damn party boat for a two-hour meeting to sign a peace treaty. There, I mean, listen, both Napoleon and Alex, you got people starving in your country, and this is what you're going to do? So the peace treaty meant that they would support Napoleon against England. They were all, but of course it didn't, you know, it didn't last, the peace treaty. So I just, I just thought that was just so just, you know, speaking of Alexander the Great, like you guys remember that story about, um, you know, his funeral was like, I believe it was like the first gay pride parade because it was just like fanfare after fanfare after fanfare. So they just don't, they don't do things lightly with the royalty. All right. So around this time, he became, again, the paranoia of his father's death, the stress of the war, all that stuff is starting to really get to Alex. Now, at one point, he became very popular, like he was a total celebrity in his country, but that the tides quickly cha uh, um, changed. And around this time, too, he decided that it was going to be, it would be who of the country of Russia to build these mil military bases. So they built these military bases in Russia where the families could actually live with the, their husbands who were soldiers. Okay, which is, we, we do that now. You know, I think all countries have military bases. My boyfriend grew up in a military family. He lived all over the world on military, American military bases. You know, that's what we do now. But here's the thing, y'all. Here's the catch, because there's no such thing as a free, free lunch, right? Here's the catch. If your husband is in the Russian military, and you move and li live on a military base with your husband, and you get pregnant, and you have a son, at the age of seven, that son is now required to sign up for the Russian military and become parented by the government, not by you. This was not very popular with the Russian people, as it should not be popular with the Russian people. But it just seems like throughout history, they've always tried to do things to the government and take yeah. over the children, right? So, um, so he then all of a sudden started to get super paranoid and all those free thinkers, that cabinet he created in the beginning of his reign, now he had people watching them because he was paranoid about them. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we all have a three letter agency watching us, but these people he brought in to bring, a, a, a bring about a more balanced society, he's now got them on his hit list. He now tightened censorship up where he had relaxed censorship in the beginning. He now tightened it up. Um, uh, his mental illness starts to get really bad at this point. And at this point, this is when a lot of, a lot of historians believe that he went full blown schizophrenic and his wife, his bestie, Elizabeth really steps in and tries to take care of him. Kind of like his mother did with Paul. Like she really, um, really tries to step in and help him and help calm him down to make, to mediate the issues right now. Around this time, she gets diagnosed with tuberculosis, which was big at this time. You know, you cough, the blood comes up. And everybody knows that the cure for tubercul tuberculosis back then was moving to the countryside, getting out of cities. And so when she's diagnosed, because I, I actually think out of everybody in Alex's life, the person that he actually loved was Elizabeth. Even though they did not have an intimate relationship, I think he truly loved her. And I think they truly loved each other more so than themselves being pawn. Like, I think Alex was loved by Catherine, but she he was also a pawn for her as well. I think they truly did love each other, which is why I really like their relationship. So he decided that they were gonna, he was gonna take Elizabeth down to Taganrog, which is near the Ukraine. It's like the south of Russia on the sea. He was gonna take her there. And so he tells his cabinet, the Tsarina has tuberculosis. I'm going to take her down. We're going to live in this little town on the sea. And this, I, I, I kind of find cute. He had been, um, he'd been the Tsar for 25 years now. And he had wrote in a letter that he really wanted to retire, that he didn't think it was fair that the military got to retire, but the Tsar couldn't. So he goes down a little bit before Elizabeth and he gets this house. I think the house is still like marked in this town. It's a smaller house. It's like a one-story smaller house. Alex himself, he doesn't hire people to do this or order people. To, he does this himself. He cleans the house up himself. 
he sets the furniture up himself and then he brings Elizabeth down. And for two months, they lived in this town and people said that they lived in this town just like they were subjects. They were just peasants. They would read each other books. They would take walks around the town and wave to people like they were just one of the people. Well, here's the problem. As sweet as that is, here's the problem. He's still the czar. Like he said he wanted to retire, but he didn't actually make an announcement where he was going to abdicate or anything. He's still the czar. So nobody's ruling Russia at this time. He's down playing house with religion, which is what he always wanted. He never wanted to be the czar. He always mentioned he wanted to go off to a small town with Elizabeth and just live a normal life. So he's living what he always wanted to, but he has neglected to tie up the loose ends in the government. So what Beauties. starts to happen? Revolts start happening. We're talking mm -hmm. a civil war is about to break out in Russia. So this is where it gets juicy, guys, because around the time where his advisors are like sending letters and coming down on horses saying, you got to you got to come back. You, you can't do this to us. He develops typhus, supposedly. Now, typhus is just like a really, really bad fever. You get rashes and allegedly he develops typhus and he boom, he dies. And then six months later, Elizabeth dies of of um, tuberculosis. All right. So. Now, again, there was no children. So the next in line was his brother. Now, there are speculations that before his death, he had spoke to his younger brother, Nicholas, about abdication. But we know that when he died, there was like Nicholas, it was like Constantine. And there was like different Nicholas wasn't the second in line. And so there were these brothers kind of like didn't know who was going to be the czar. But we have record that he did want Nicholas to be the czar next after him. So almost immediately after he died, conspiracy started that he had faked his own death. And they believed that he was a man named Fyodor Kuzmik. Now, Fyodor Kuzmik, who was a monk in the south of Russia, looked a lot like Alex, spoke many languages, which was only common for royalty to speak multiple languages, like not just two or three, but like multiple languages. Um, he was deaf in his left ear, just like Alex. And he absolutely would refuse to talk about his early life, like wouldn't do it. And even to this day, scholars, this is what gets the scholars who don't think that actually think Alex died. It has been by multiple people who study handwriting Theodore's handwriting and Alex's handwriting are identical. One and the same, yeah. Yeah. So Theodore died in 1864. So if Theodore was actually Alex the first, then he lived into his late 80s. He lived a very long life. Now they say Elizabeth faked her death too. And she went and lived as a nun in a nunnery. They both got out of the private eye of private life of Russia. But I, so that's the story of Alex, the first guys um, of Russia and his fake death. And um, this shit's been done before, y'all. It's been done. Yeah, before. no, it makes perfect sense to me that he would have faked um, his death and that he would have become a monk. <laughs> he didn't want to be a czar in the first place. Like, he did not yeah. want to do it. And yeah. he just forgot, I think in his paranoia, forgot that if he was going to run off to the south of Russia, he needed to actually abdicate. Yeah, right? absolutely. He needed to abdicate. Absolutely. And oopsie, wow. he forgot that part. So you guys, we've got, we've got Nicholas I, Alexander II, and then Nicholas II. We've got a, a few czars in between now and the bulk of it. I'm going to look through them tonight or tomorrow because we got the eclipse today. If I find any juicy stories between this story and the Anastasia Romanoff, we'll cover that. But if there's nothing super juicy, then I'll just put the timeline in the next deep dive and then we'll get to Anastasia Romanoff. But if there's, you never know, y'all. We might find another pickled penis. I, you can't, these Russians, you just never know like what you're going to find with these Russians. So I'm going to look, I'm going to look through the history and see if there's anything else we need to talk about before we get to the last czar of Russia. Um, because Absolutely. I just, and I encourage you guys to go and look this story up for yourself too, just to see the similarities between this story and what we've been told about this timeline as well. And just kind of see where history is repeating itself and what we can do to, um, to 
to get back and get get good with ourselves, right? Yeah. Well, super interesting. I mean, as you say, you know, our ancestors certainly had their shenanigans and definitely did their gallivanting around the globe in uh, more ostentatious ways than we we can ever imagine. Um, just because they didn't have aeroplanes and um, things like that, then they sure got around. They sure got around. They could take their deaths way easier back mm. then. All it would take would me exactly. just like it, dyeing mm. my hair a different color and being like, my name's Martha now. <laughs> That's all there was no social media then, so it was a whole lot easier. No DNA <laughs> testing, no fingerprinting. Yeah, exactly. Think about how many murders they got away with back then. Yeah, exactly. They were dodgy as hell, man. (laughs) Yay. Okay, Bryce, that was lovely. Thank you. And then we shall see you next week for whatever's on the... Yeah, I'll let you know. I'm going to dig through it. And again, if there's any juicy stories, we'll cover that because we were here for it. Um, I mean, we can't... I've covered the Valois. I've covered the Bourbons. I've covered, you know, all the English royal families, but I have never in my life been so fascinated <laughs> the russians take the cake they the are russians literally the juiciest the of juicies yeah no they they sure as heck do i mean even to this day and age with putin and all these shenanigans and all these wives and i don't know with his gymnastic wife and kids is and it, is it lenin's body somebody can put it in the comment section it's either lenin or stalin one of the two body is embalmed still at some museum in russia does it have a head does it it does have a head it does have a head (laughs) and i I remember finding that information out when i was studying ava perone and her embalmment i mean that's a story y'all no wonder they made a musical out of it it's crazy but and i was like holy shit like i can't remember if it's lennon or stalin one of them is like still just hanging out with rasputin's penis like I'm sure Catherine's furniture is over there. You know, they just kind of, you know, I will say, like, congratulations. You mean the Russians, they don't try to hide it. They just, uh, they could, they could, they could, they could start an entire new sex shop with all these gadgets that they had in those days. That's for sure. And they own it. They own it. They're like, yep, that's our history. There it is. For better or for (laughs) worse. You want to see it? Here it is. So I, and I, I love, and I want to say that too, guys, even though we break down these, these, these royal families, I just want to make it very clear if we do have some Russians listening right now, when we make fun of these royal families, I think I can speak for you, Shanti, too, when we say we understand the government and the people are two totally different things. Exactly. So there's, please, there's no offense ever. And when we no. talk about certain things, I mean, we're not, uh, yeah, someone got quite upset early on saying bestiality is not a joke. It's, of course, it's not a joke. I mean... Well, first of all, that was just a rumor. There's no proof that that ever happened. Exactly. So there's none of that. And I hope you all realize that. So anyway. Okay. Well, listen, I've got a show in 40 minutes. Oh, go get the girl. uh, Lynn Monet, Monet, guys. Um, She's been on before. She was on with Jerry Marzinski. Um, She's also an ex-psych nurse. Um, so she's gonna be spelling some. She things. might know more about the Romanovs than I do. She could probably uh, evaluate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'll see you back in a little while. It's a marvelous Monday, and it's a very awesome eclipse. And I wish you all well, sending you lots of love. And I have no doubt that um we're all gonna be seeing each other tomorrow anyway. Right. Yes. So. Chad Daybell, the opening statement start tomorrow. And then we're Wednesday. I'm so happy we caught this story right as the second trial is starting. I feel like that's serendipitous because we can talk all about this. And Shanti, while you were doing your spooky two advertisement, I sent you a link to a breakdown of Mormon. I saw it. And we're going to do it. And we're going to be de- d- diving deep into the Mormon church soon because yeah. there's just too much nonsense going on there. As you know, I always say the Mormon Church is one of the five pillars of the Illuminati, which means they they delve, they are rife and deep in the satanic cult. Um, and I'm not surprised that now at the end times, right, because these are now seen as the end times, uh, the biblical times, basically. Um, so many, so many Mormons and so much Mormonism and 
killing and maiming and torturing in the name of God. It's yeah, it's all Delulu. They're Delulu. They are Delulu. I mean, Delulu. Guys, I mean, even in the Book of Mormon, there is a story right at the beginning where it's like God tells Nephi to like cut someone's head off, which, listen, if the Spirit is telling you to cut someone's head off, it's not God. So the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, there's some sketchy stuff going on. But again, in the Bible, God tells uh, tells um, Abraham to kill his son too. So God never would do that. The real God. Did so he? I was going to say, God. God would never expect mm -hmm. that of anyone. Nope. So who's um, the God of the Bible? Who's the God of Mormonism? Yes. I don't think it's the real God, but we'll get into that because it, it does explain a lot about what's happening in these cases. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, everybody, I'm going to see you soon in just over half an hour again. So take care. Thank you, Brycey Boo. Always wonderful to see you. See you back on Wednesday. And you guys, I will see you again tomorrow. Oh, I've got an interview tomorrow with a spooky two guy, five o'clock my time as well. Um, but I'll keep you updated. Lots of love. Take good care, everybody. And God bless you all. Bye, guys.